on the wings of a snow white dove. Let me ask you something here this morning. Is there anything wrong with rituals, ordinances, uh, doing things in a certain way, rules, regulations? Is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily. Y'all don't want to play the game, do you? I see you looking at me. I have my answer. No, not necessarily. There's nothing really wrong with rules. There's nothing wrong with regulations. If we didn't have those, it would be chaos, wouldn't it? You think about it here in this country. If we didn't have rules and regulations of the law of what to do, this country would really be in chaos. If we didn't have ordinances in the church, the church wouldn't have organization. It wouldn't have, the, the, and our ordinance is obviously the Lord's Supper. You know what I'm talking about, the communion. But why do we take that? Why do we take communion? Why do we take the Lord's Supper? Because it is in remembrance of Him, right? It doesn't do anything to us to make us more righteous or more saved, does it? It is an act, it is a symbol of taking something to remember Christ. The bread, the wine, uh, to remember what he gave. The bread being his body, the wine being his blood for our salvation. Amen? That's what the Lord's Supper, the communion, is all about. In it itself, in that ritual, or in that ordinance, is nothing to do with gaining more salvation. All right? Or guaranteeing your salvation. That has nothing to do with it at all. But we're going to look at today here in Romans chapter 4, starting with verse 9. Paul is still dealing with, and it's going to sound a lot like last week's sermon, he's still dealing with the fact that the Jewish nation, the Jewish man, is not wanting to give up on his law and upon his ordinances. The ordinances of circumcision, basically. The, the law and the, and the works that he can do in order to gain his salvation. The Jewish man is still believing that if I just keep the law, I do the law, I do the works of the law, and I, I make sure my boys are circumcised on the eighth day after they're born, and I'm circumcised, then uh, God's got to accept me. That's what the Jewish man is thinking. You've got to go back to this day when Paul is talking to these guys because today it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. We're like, I don't understand the Jewish mindset. I don't understand what Paul is talking about here with this circumcision stuff, with this, with this law stuff. I believe in the grace of Jesus. That's right, you're on this side of the cross. It's all about grace, isn't it? It's all about God's mercy and God's grace upon us and his speaking to us and calling us and us just believing without any works whatsoever for our salvation. Amen? Thank God. Amen? Thank God that it's paid for. It's all done. It's over with by the cross of Christ and what he did on the cross. All we do is what? Believe. And the works that come after that belief are not so we can gain more salvation. It's because we already have it. Amen? Amen? We already have salvation, so that, that implores us, if you will, that motivates us, if you will, to do the other works, to feed the hungry, to give a glass of water to somebody that's thirsty, to tell them about the kingdom of God, to tell them there is salvation, to go you therefore. Amen, church? That's why you do that stuff, because you already have salvation. You got all you're going to get. Amen? You got all you're going to get. You're going to see him face to face. Like that song says, my faith will become sight. One day, everybody in this room will see Jesus face to face. And you'll recognize him even though you've never seen him before. Isn't that awesome? You'll recognize him even though you've never seen him face to face before. When you see his face and you look into his eyes, you will know that's Jesus. You'll know that's your Messiah. You'll know that's your Savior. So look what Paul has to say here. We're going to go through quite a few of the verses here. But look and start in chapter 4, verse 9. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith 
so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. That's a mouthful in those verses right there. And that's kind of hard to read, actually. But, but notice what he's saying here. And, and when it starts in verse 9, he said, Is this blessedness just for the circumcised? When, when Paul says the circumcised, he's talking about the Jewish nation. All right? Understand that. He's not, instead of saying Jew and Gentile, he's going to go on something that the Jewish nation really put a lot of value into. The fact that all their males were circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. Following the law that God gave Abraham the rule that God gave Abraham as a covenant between him and Abraham and all of his offspring. You understand that? Abraham was told to do that. If you look over in Genesis 15, 16, and 7, Abraham is told to do that after Ishmael is born, not when Isaac is born. Ishmael's been born, and God tells Abraham one day, says, I want you to circumcise Ishmael. I want you to circumcise every male in the camp that belongs to you, every human being. I want every male circumcised as a covenant, as a, as a promise between me and you that this is going to take place. Now, what's happening here is Paul's trying to argue, if you will, with this Jewish man saying Abraham was justified. Abraham was righteous because he was circumcised. No, no, no. If you read the story correctly in chronological order, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldee and Haran. He left Haran at the point 14 years before he was circumcised. Fourteen years have passed since he left to go to Palmer's land to go where God told him to go. So circumcision has nothing to do with his righteousness. And Paul's trying to get the Jewish man to understand this. He was circumcised 14 years after faith was credited to him as righteousness. After. So circumcision has nothing to do with it. And Paul, I mean, uh, Abraham circumcised himself and all of his male children and all of his, his male servants because they were going to be of the house of Abraham. Abraham is where the Jewish nation began. Okay, they're not in existence yet until God calls out Abraham, which means what? Abraham's what? Gentile, isn't he? There's no Jewish nation before Abraham. He calls out a Gentile, makes the Jewish nation from him, from him. And the nation is born out of faith, not a circumcision and not the law. Out of faith, that nation is born to Abraham. God promised Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Now, when he says nations, it's not the 12 tribes. Because the 12 tribes are one nation, aren't they? So see, way back in Genesis, God's already trying to tell people. He's already telling, the, he's not explaining what the church is. But he's already telling Abraham that you're going to be the father of not only this nation that I'm going to build out of you, but other nations, the Americans, the American Indians, the Africans, the Germans, the Russians, the whoever else, whatever else nation believes on the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, Abraham is their father. You get it? Abraham is your father by the faith that he showed and the faith that you show. He's not your physical father. No, he's not your bloodline father. No, he is your spiritual line father. Abraham is. And the promise that was given to him was that Abraham is going to inherit all the earth. The promise is given to us spiritually is that we're going to inherit heaven. We're not going to inherit anything upon the earth. That was given to Abraham and his descend physical descendants. Us, we inherit the supernatural, the spiritual things that Abraham was promised, which is what? Salvation. Salvation for all who will what? Believe. If you don't believe and if you don't receive it, then it's not yours. And you're not a child of Abraham. Bottom line, you're a child of the devil until you surrender to God. You really are. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's who you're following. Jesus even looked at the Pharisees years late, hundreds of years later after this was done. He looked at him and says, they said, We're, our father is Abraham. Who do you think you are talking? He said, no, your father is the devil. He just flat out called it what it was. Your father's the devil. What happened to those Pharisees? They were abiding the law. They were doing all the rules. They were doing all the sacrifices. They were doing everything they could possibly do to gain their righteousness, but except one problem. They didn't believe. They did not have faith. So the entire church that is being run, the Judaism, Judaism church, whatever, Jewish church of that day is being run by works, 
That's why all the money changers are in there, the, all the law, all that kind of stuff is going. They're being run by everything except what they're supposed to be run by, and that is faith in God and believing God. And those laws, you look back on Deuteronomy, you look back on Leviticus, you look at all those laws that man made and put together and God made for man, and man put them all together. It just kept binding them down, didn't it? It kept binding them down. They had the original Ten Commandments. They could have lived just off of that, but they couldn't handle it. They had to add more to it and add more to it. Look at the laws of us here in America. Should be just a few moral laws. We ought to be all right, isn't there? But there's thousands of them on the books. And just in Louisiana, I mean, there's thousands of them on the books. Some probably need to be taken off about your donkey can't cross the road or what, you know, but I'm just saying that. Anyway, but, you know, I'm saying there's thousands of laws on the books because man, every time a law is made, he's going to figure out some way to break it or to push it to the envelope. So man keeps making more laws and putting more fences up. And, and Paul here is trying to get the Jewish nation, he's trying to get this Jewish man to understand Jesus fulfilled the law. It's all about him now. But the Jewish man can't accept that. He wants to have Jesus, and you see it in the other books of Corinthians and Ephesians and all. They, all you converts, of, all you Gentiles, y'all can have Jesus now. You can have this Jesus thing, but you've got to get circumcised if you're going to get into the church, if you're going to be part of our church. You understand what was going on back then? The Jewish man was trying to bring his Judaism into Christianity. It just doesn't mix, does it? That's like the Hindu. You witness to a Hindu or, or somebody, and you say, okay, now you believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, and they want to take Jesus, but they want to add him to the religion they already have. It doesn't work that way. You know, our God is zealous. God, he, he, he does not share his glory with anybody, does he? You're going to accept God, all other religions are out of the way. You're going to accept Jesus Christ, all other religions are out of the way. It's about just him. And God set it up that way. Man has made all the other religions. But look what he said. He said, is this blessedness just for the circumcised or the Jew? Or also for the uncircumcised, for the Gentile? Yeah, it's for all of them. And that's exactly what he's talking about. He says, we've been saying in the past that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Now, Paul brings this up. The Jewish man doesn't bring it up. Because Paul understands how the Jewish man understands circumcision. It is of utmost importance in their salvation. They have put it, instead of it being a sign that they have followed God, they're now making it a mandatory requirement in order to be saved, in order to get into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, I think as I was studying, there's only three things. There was uh, uh, confession and uh, repentance and circumcision. I mean, it's like <laughs> if you didn't have circumcision, you couldn't be a part of it. You were not going into the kingdom of God unless you were circumcised. They were so strong on that because Abraham did it. But they missed the point of why Abraham did it. It was a sign to God, to Abraham, to God, to Abraham. And Abraham back to God that he was of the covenant people. And the promise was coming. And you keep this promise, Abraham. You do this with all your male children. And the Jewish nation will do it with you. The whole nation I'm about to make of you will do it with you. And he says, trust me on this. Just do this and this will be your identity. Now, without going into much depth about what circumcision is, circumcision is just for the males, and it's when they would, put, they would actually cut a part of the flesh off of your identity. Let's put it that way, amen? <laughs> of your identity. And the reason I say it's of your identity is when a baby is born, the doctor does what? Looks at the identity and says, oh, it's a boy, it's a girl. He didn't look at the kid's face and say that. He looked at a certain part of the child's anatomy. He said, you got a boy or a girl. Well, guess what, fellas? Our identity with God is what God wanted, a piece of your identity. That's our covenant. I want a piece of your identity. You do every male child that way, Abraham, and that shows you're in covenant with me, Almighty God. Now today, Paul, if you read some of his other writings, he says, you know what? The Holy Spirit comes now today on this side of the cross and does a circumcision of the heart. Guess what? You can't see that, can you? You can't identify that humanly. Back then they could with the circumcision of the flesh. I can prove I'm a Jew, you know. No, no, it doesn't work that way anymore. You can't prove you're a Christian by the circumcision because it's of the inner man. Amen? It's an inside thing. And God cuts away a part. He makes an identity with you through Christ when you're saved that nobody can see unless you live in it. Why is it so hard to point out Christians in today's world? They mingle in so well because there's no visible evidence that you're a Christian. You will see it in their lifestyle. You'll see it in their countenance. Maybe you'll hear it coming from their mouth. But I know a lot of religious people can talk a good talk, but their walk is bad. 
Amen? Their walk isn't empowered by the Holy Spirit. Their talk is empowered by the knowledge of the Bible. And they got it down, but there's no power. There's no spirit. And they can walk, and they can fool you, man. You think, oh, that man is wonderful. He's a man of God. He, ooh, yeah, yeah, you know, because they can walk that walk. They can make it happen in the flesh, if you will, until the spirit is needed. Then you find out. Then you find out. And so the circumcision of the flesh is not visible. Your salvation is only visible by the way you act when you get outside these walls, by the power that flows through you, by the opportunities. As I said before, watch for the opportunities. God's going to give you an opportunity, and the Holy Spirit empowers you at that moment, and you do that, op- you do that work to whoever it may be, to whomever it may be. God empowers that. So he says, was it the circumcision? Because Jews put a lot of emphasis on the circumcision. He says, was it before or was it after? He says, nope, it was before Abram was circumcised. When God called him out of the land of the Chaldeans, Abram was not circumcised. He believed God, what God said, and it was accredited to him, it was counted unto him as righteousness. And he followed, and he did what God said and took off on his trek. If you look at the mileage that Abraham put on his donkeys that day, I'm going to tell you, it took more than a day. It was up the other side of the mountain, back down, it was about 600 miles worth of walking before he ever actually got to the promised land, Canaan. He had to go from the Chaldeans over here by the, the, the Tiger Euphrates River. He had to go up and around the mountain range and then come back down before he got to the land of Canaan. So it's quite a few hour, uh, years probably before he got there, but he, he takes off in faith. He be- just believed God, and he did it. And he says he received his circum- verse 11, he says he received a sign of cir- the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. He received that before he ever got it. And he says here, he's, so then he's the father of all who believe, not all who get circumcised. He's the father of all who believe. He's trying to tell his Jewish man, understand this, even those that have not been served, in order that righteousness may be credited to them, us, of the uncircumcision. Let's put it that way. That righteousness should be credited to us also. Why, how? By one you believe. It was credited to Abraham when he believed. It's credited to you when you believe. And it's not your righteousness, is it, church? We got nothing to brag about. Remember last week, he said, who can boast about this? Nobody. Because God put it on us. It's the righteousness of when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we believe in God, he gives it to us. It's a, it's a righteousness that is his imputed upon us. And the justification takes part when we confess our sin, when we realize he's our Savior and we need him as Savior, then it's justified just as we've never done it. God has justified us through Christ. Not what we've done, but through him. So therefore, we got nothing to brag about, do we? Except God. Only thing I can brag about about salvation is it's all the grace of God. I did nothing but believe. All I did was say, ooh, now I see. I once was blind, but now I see what God is. And I believe, and I received it. I did it absolutely nothing since then to earn my salvation did nothing beforehand to earn my salvation. Matter of fact, I was running from God when I got saved. Amen? How many of y'all were running from God when you got saved? I was running. I was, wasn't even paying attention to God when suddenly I hear the voice of God say, Hey, Andy. And the Holy Spirit of God grabbed my heart and pulled. Pulled me off that bench of that old church. And I was grabbing. He pulled and said, Come. Come. Here's your invitation. Come and be a part of this kingdom. Come and believe. Come and receive. I did. And from the moment I did, guess what? I changed, it changed teams, didn't it? No longer in the team of, of, of a sinner and, the, and, the, and the, the team of Satan. And I changed teams and went to God's team. All of a sudden, God starts calling me a saint. All of a sudden, God starts saying, guess what? You don't have to bow down to sin anymore. You can overcome it. If you really want to, I give you the power to do so. It's a whole brand new team, church. Those of us in this room that have given our life to Christ, you're on a different team now. And matter of fact, you're on a team now that you don't have to bow down to sin anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. Matter of fact, you can stand against it now and overcome it. You can stand against it and overcome it. Your choice. Still your choice. Still your choice by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he says here, and he keeps going, he says in verse 13, he's also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You know what he's talking about? He's the father of the circumcised who also have faith. He's talking about a believing Jewish man. He's talking about a saved Jewish man. 
one that has believed who Christ is, has changed their mind about who he is, they have repented, they've turned around, they've given their life to Jesus Christ, they now are just like us on this side of the cross. They believe by faith that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. And that faith is accredited to them as righteousness and salvation, just like it is us. So can the Jewish man be saved today? Absolutely. All he's got to do is believe. All he's got to do is put thousands of years of his teaching behind him and believe that this guy from Nazareth, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. He is God's son like God said he was. All he's got to do is believe God and God will save his soul just like he did ours. He'd do it the same way he did ours, by faith. The Jew, Jewish man has no different. They have no upper hand on us as far as believing who Jesus Christ was. They're on, we're on level ground, folks. They got no upper hand. They got no... Uh, uh, favoritism of God when it comes to salvation it's the same way we approach it they approach it the very same way to this very day on this side of the cross they approach it the very same way as a matter of fact they tried to approach it by law and they kept failing miserably we'll get into that in just a moment but the believing Jews he said they, they believe the same way and then in verse 13 he jumps on the law he gets off the circumcision thing because that's one of the big things Jews uh, leaned on for their salvation but they also leaned on the law and obeying that law and keeping that law earned them the right for salvation. You understand where I'm going with this? Listen, folks, that's not too far-fetched from where we are today. There are people that are doing things trying to earn God's favor and earn his salvation when God says you can't do it that way. You can go to church all your life. You can sing all the hymns, the choruses, the whatever you want to sing. You can drop money in the offering plate, but if you never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, in your life, it won't matter. You will meet Jesus face to face. You meet God face to face one day and go, I gave to the church budget. I did. This. I even taught a class in church. I did. This. I did. And God's going to look and go, I don't even know who you are. I don't know you. K N O W. I don't know who you are because it's about a relationship with Him, not doing a bunch of things. Amen? It's about that relationship. We got to get that straight, folks. There's a lot of folks in church this morning don't have that right yet. They're thinking, you know, I'm coming to church, I'm putting my time in, and God can't help but let me in, right? I went to his church building, I put my fire insurance in the plate, I did all this, I did, you know, my get out of hell free card, whatever. It doesn't work that way, but a lot of people think it does, that the man upstairs can't help but forgive him. Let me tell you something, he's not a man, he's God. He's a spirit. He's not like people think a man upstairs. He doesn't think like a man. He doesn't react like a man. He is God Almighty. And he thinks and he acts higher than we do. Way higher. Because I read some of the stuff in this book that he's done, and I'm thinking, man, I'd have never thought of that. No, I wouldn't have thought because I'm just a mere man. He's God. His ways are higher. Isaiah pointed out very clear one day. He said, ooh, he's way up there on that throne. He is his ways are higher than man. His thoughts are higher than mine. Everything about him is way above my level of understanding. Isaiah gave us a glimpse of that. And it's the same God, amen? It's the same one Isaiah talked to. It's the same one he had communion with is our God also. But then in verse 13, he says, Not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For those who live by the law are heirs. Faith has no value. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is absolutely worthless. In other words, if you can keep the law, then what the heck do you need faith for? What do you need Jesus for? Why did he even have to come if the law will get us there? If obeying that law will get us there? You know there's a natural phenomenon about human beings that's just... I think God put it in us. I mean, I have to believe that, that even from the Garden of Eden... What was the law of the Garden of Eden? Do not eat of the fruit of that tree, Adam and Eve. What did they do? Went right to the tree. Right to the tree. There's a natural thing about a law. When you say you cannot do something or don't do something, that's exactly the thing that draws you to make you want to do it, isn't it? Isn't that weird about us? There's a psychologist who pulled a, a stunt like this one time in a children's playground. He says, watch this. He's trying to show another psychologist how this all works, that law tends to draw us. He said, I'm going to tell these little kids, these little 
two- and three-year-old, four-year-old. She said, I'm going to tell them they can play anywhere on this playground they want to, but do not go over here on this flower bed area and spit in this flower bed. Don't even get near it. He said, now, there's the law. Y'all go play. And he said, back, and he said, watch this. And slowly but surely, one at a time, started inching over toward that flower bed, getting closer to it and closer to it. And finally, one brave little boy got over there and went, he just laid one in it. And then others saw him do it, and they start, they looking around, see what happened. Nothing happened. So they all started easing over to it, and two, two, three, four long, every kid in the playground spit in the flower bed because they were told not to. And inside of us is something that turns that says, I'll do what I want to do, isn't there? Don't tell me what to do. How many of you learn experiences the hard way? I've seen two-year-olds look at their mom. I don't know if you remember those little space heaters we used to have in homes, gas heaters. They, them things would get hot, boy, and you walk over and touch it, it lights you up, you know. And, and uh, I, I can remember, that, even my own home, I can remember this, watching grandkids come along and, and look at grandma and grandpa like they're crazy whenever they're going over toward that hot heater. And I've seen two-year-olds do the same things with their mom, and their mom goes, no, son, it's hot, hot, and don't touch it, it'll burn you, it's hot. And the whole time he's looking at mom and walking over here doing like this. Like, I don't believe you. And, and most time, what happens is we go, okay, you're going to have to learn the hard way. Go ahead. Go ahead, touch it. And they touch it, and wah, here they go. You know, it was hot. Why didn't you tell me? I've been telling you it was hot. But they have to learn the hard way, don't they? Human beings are just that. We were hard-headed. No wonder God calls us sheep sometimes. Amen? We just want, we got to explore. We got to find out for ourselves. And so when the law comes into play here, when Moses, came, and the law, by the way, came in 430 years after Abraham, so he wasn't obeying the law either. My Jewish friends were trying to lay that in there, and Paul says, no, 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 the law was way after Abraham. But it's interesting how we want to disobey automatically. We got to explore. We can't listen to instructions, say, don't do something, son, daughter, and we reach out there and do that very thing and get burned by it. Probably many of us in this room right now have scars from when we didn't trust what somebody was saying and we did it anyway. And we got scars to prove it. Burn marks, whatever. We got scars to prove it. Bad thing about the Garden of Eden was this. When a child touches that little heater, it just hurts that child. Hurts mama's heart too. But he'll, he'll live with a scar for the rest of his life if he burned his hand bad enough. But in the Garden, it didn't just affect that child. In the Garden, Adam and Eve reached and grabbed that fruit ate of that fruit of that tree, and it affected all of us. Because what it did, it caused all of humanity from that moment on to be born in sin and in enmity with God. Every one of us. And we're not friends of God until we surrender back to God again. And he loves us so much. What did he do? He sent Jesus to take care of that problem. It, took a long, it was a long time between that garden and Jesus coming. But God had it in his plan. He said, I'm going to send the salvation. I'm going to send my salvation through my son. He's going to pay the price of sin. That sin caused way back in the garden, that separation, that anxiety, that whatever the sin is causing your life. He's going to pay the price for that and pay the penalty for that so that mankind and I, God, can have a great relationship again. Paid for. And look, Christian, you're sitting here today. Guess what? You're enjoying that. You don't realize you are the blessed one in verse 9. Who's the ones that can see that blessing? You. Because you believe in what he did, and he, he healed, if you will, the sin. Isaiah even says, he says, with his stripes we've been healed. Healed of what? Sin. We've been healed of that relationship with God. We're healed. And because that relationship is healed, you and I have fellowship with God, not exactly in the same way Adam and Eve did, but pretty close. Pretty close. Because we're not sinless. We weren't created sinless. But we're very close to that same relationship. So you have the advantage today, Christian, of being in relationship with an almighty God who created it all, who did it all. And he's opened that gate up for you. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. He didn't do it by the law. He didn't do it by circumcision like the Jews were trying to say. He did it by faith. You believe, you have faith, and you're in. You're in. He's en engraved you and grafted you into that. And in the very last verse here, uh, verse 16 17, it says, For the, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. What is salvation? It comes by faith and grace, doesn't it? You don't earn it. 
all of his offspring can have this promise that will believe by faith. He said, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are the faith of Abraham. He's the father of us all. As it is written, and now watch this verse, I've made you a father of many nations. I said that before. It's not just the Jewish nation, all nations. He said, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. The last part of that verse is very important in the life of Abraham because when Isaac was born, Abraham's 100 and, and uh, Sarah's 90. <laughs> They're way past childbearing, aren't they? The God who calls things that aren't into being, whether it be creation or an impossible task like that, he does it. And he promised Abraham that through his seed, Abraham, you're going to have a seed with, with, with Sarah, your wife. And she's going to call him Isaac. Of course, you know the whole story of that. They've already tried to help out, and Ishmael's already on the scene. But Isaac is the promised child. Isaac is the one that the bloodline will come through. And at 100 years old and at 90 years old, they had a baby. Could you imagine? Can you imagine just the miracle that took place there? The God who calls things into existence that don't exist. The God who brings the dead back to life. Sarah's womb was way long dead. He brought it back to life in order to bring Isaac into the world. That's the same God we serve, church. Amen? That's the same God who loves you so much he didn't leave you alone. That's the same God that kept coming after you time and time again when you were running away from him and saying, turn around, come back, come home, come home. Come, my son. Come, my daughter. Come on. Come on before it's too late. Come on. And he's not only drawing you, he's drawing everybody in central and all the areas around us, which makes it so much easier for us to say, God loves you, and he wants to save you. And I know the way you can be saved. Just that simple. Open the door, make the conversation happen. The Lord knows how many you will draw into the kingdom with that one question, that one statement. God can save you. God will save you. If you just trust in him. I encourage you to do that throughout this week. You get an opportunity. Go for it church. Amen. Go for it. You've got the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Of Almighty God inside of you Christian. You can do this. You can do this. Matter of fact he's commanded we do that. Would you stand please. With head bowed and eyes closed. All to Jesus. I surrender.